Um, but today, our theme is leadership in this great country, the United States of America, which has probably one of the most bizarre uh, election campaigns that any of us have ever seen. And no one better to discuss that with than New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd, for whom I imagine, Maureen, this has been a gift from heaven. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make this stuff up. You say in one of your uh, columns that you've actually gone, this, is, this has gone beyond parody. How, how do you sit down and write something that, that, doesn't, even, that, that doesn't sound ridiculous, given the, the subject matter you have to deal with? This election has everything. It has Russian hackers, white supremacists, dueling Kardashian-like Twitter feuds, uh, dueling federal investigations, um, Peppy the Frog, small hands, penis taunts, conspiracy theories, anything you could want and not want in an election, this one has. And, um, you know, when Tom Wolfe wrote Bonfire of the Vanities, things that were happening in New York kept moving faster than he could write the satire. And I feel like that's what's happening here. And um, I did a satire when, when Trump came down to Washington, you know, Trump's relationship with the Republican Party reminds me of a kind of bus and truck version of Taming of the Shrew. So the Republicans are tr keep trying to tame him, but he's not going to have it, and he keeps trying to, you know, whine to them that they should be nicer to him. So he came down for his big summit meeting with Paul Ryan behind closed doors. So I did a satirical version, uh, and it's in the book about you know, what would happen with those two, and he would be making up nicknames, Two-Face Paul, and, you know, and Paul Ryan would be, you know, he'd be, <laughs> Paul Ryan has that Irish undertaker air, would be very disapproving of Trump. Oh, sorry, Terry. <laughs> and, um, I know them well. <laughs> and this is, this is so funny, so then, for the next Sunday, I got an interview with Trump about what really happened at the meeting. And he described it exactly as I had written it. So then I, I didn't know what to do. So I had to write the first graph of that column. This is not a satire. This is the real meeting. So they're both in the book. So if you compare them, it just gives you a really eerie feeling. Um. I'm waiting for when Trump is going to start blaming Hillary for Brad and Angelina breaking up. Oh, you know, he's joking, but um, Raffi, Raff, my friend who is uh, working with me to help me get through this, is, was we were laughing so hard in the car yesterday because we were looking at some old Trump tweets from before he started running, and he obsessed for a week about the breakup of Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart. He's like a 13-year-old girl, you know? It's just all, he, he was tweeting that Robert Pattinson was better off and he'd introduce him to a Miss Universe contestant. And, um, you know, so he is like a 13-year-old girl with like uh, obsession of hair. <laughs> So it, that actually isn't a joke. I bet if he weren't, if Kelly and Conway hadn't stolen his phone, he would be tweeting about Brad and Angelina. And I don't think it would be pretty for Angelina. Not going there. <laughs> um, or any further. Um, so like some of you in this hall, um, I've been watching House of Cards for some years. And when it first came out, you know, I thought David Fincher was really a little bit over the top, you know, this hypocrisy in Washington and the, the conspiracy theories, it was a little bit too rich, but it was fiction. Now, when you watch Kevin Spacey, it's almost like he's behind the curve. <laughs> the, what we're seeing in real time is even more absurd than, than fiction. So how do, you, how do you make sense of that in a, in a bigger political sense in, in what's happening in this country? Well, obviously, political reporters have never seen anything like this. So 
they're trying, to me, it's, it's very reminiscent of Who Killed Jessica Rabbit, where you have the toons interacting with the humans. So for a long time in New York, Trump was like this Batman tune, and now he's running kind of as a tune, and the reporters keep trying to treat them both as humans. So um, the other day, Trump said he had an announcement about the birther issue. <laughs> And so all the reporters went, and then afterwards they were really mad and said they got played, and Trump really was just um, promoting his hotel. But, you know, if, if the reporters didn't know that Trump was going to invite them there to make an infomercial about his new hotel in Washington, then they really need to read my book. Um, because there was, they were lucky they didn't get out of there without having to buy timeshares. <laughs> so Trump says, Maureen Dowd has treated me really badly. And I can just hear him say it, really badly. Why does he still take your calls? Well, he did tweet. He, I don't think he would take my calls now because he, he, I was bracing for it, but he sent you know, me a mean tweet not sent me, sorry, he put on the internet uh, some mean tweets over the weekend, and he called me uh, wacky, crazy, neurotic dope. And, uh, you know, that was deeply troubling because, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are ahead of me, you're too smart. That was deeply troubling because he, he didn't really put the time into it to give me an original nickname because, <laughs> Those are the same, you know, adjectives he uses about Megyn Kelly and Mika Brzezinski. And so I think if he really cared about me, he would have put some work in and given me something like Pocahontas, as Elizabeth Warren has, or Sleepy Eyes, Chuck Todd. So, Donald, you can do better. I, I guess we need to have uh, equal opportunity um, uh, personality attacks. Uh, Hillary Clinton, what kind of access do you have to her? Um, in the book, I started covering her in 92. So she was, you know, the wife of Bill Clinton. And when I went back, and I was a news reporter then, I was really shocked. Some of the interviews have asked if I had a girl crush on her because I was so supportive. And uh, you know, that was the beginning of this era where these women like Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton who have the same educational background and some of the same credentials as their husbands are forced into this little satin jewel box, this antiquated first lady role. And, you know, I was sympathetic to her and she got really upset during the campaign because they sent her some stationery and it said Hillary Clinton and they had dropped the rod amount. She had gone through that whole thing in Arkansas about her name where, you know, she had to take his name for him to win re-election. So, um, so I have this really supportive long piece about that era and we went to this um, revolving restaurant in Covington, Kentucky and we drank white wine and we we ate dinner and she told me this story about how when she was at Yale Law School she worked at a fish sliming factory in Alaska and she noticed that the fish were purple and black and yucky looking and she confronted the owner about it and the owner said just keep quiet about it and of course being Hillary Clinton she didn't she quit and uh, told people and you know that's the idealistic public servant side of her. And then, you know, I covered her in healthcare, and I said her performance on the Hill was dazzling. And again, I had my doubts about turning over 16% of the government to her because, not because she wasn't smart, but because she was the president's wife, and I thought people wouldn't tell her if things went wrong. And then, but I, I put all those aside and again wrote this really supportive news coverage. But then that's where she began to build up, you know, Trump has his wall and she has sort of an emotional wall. And she talked about it in an interview last week where she said she walled off part of herself and she kind of uh, has the idealistic public servant side, but then she has 
she sometimes makes decisions from a darker place of fear and paranoia. And you see it in everything from the email server to even the health thing. I mean, I have been on book tour for four days and I have a fever and sprained my ankle. I mean, people know when you're on the road, you get sick. And, but she couldn't level even about pneumonia. And David Axelrod you know, said the problem was not the health, it's the stealth, that she just has this allergy to transparency. And it's sad because that darker side trips up the lighter side, and so it's a very self-destructive pattern that you can kind of trace in the book. Um, you are better than anyone I know at these very succinct, almost throwaway lines that destroy people. Um, <laughs> With such grace. I and, wish. And perfect syntax. Um, one of the ones I liked, um, you, you compared the two of them, um, Trump, the out-of-control id, taunting the highly controlled superego. Tell me why first Trump and then Hillary are running for president. Why they really want to do this job and, and, and what their different motivations are. Um. In the book, I, I write about how I went out with Trump in 1999. And again, he was this kind of Batman figure. And, you know, once in a while, he would test the waters about running for president, but nobody took it seriously, and he didn't really seem to. And we were on his plane, and it's all full of guilt and a big bed and fake French Impressionist paintings. And he was dating Melania then. And uh, so we went down to Miami, and he gave a speech to Cuban Americans, and they loved him. And then we walked up to his first presidential rope line, and he was just very shy about it. And you know, then he didn't end up running. And I just figured, you know, he's a clinical narcissist, and it was just a way to get attention every few years. Um, but I think. At some point, you know, he realized he was 69, and it was kind of now or never. But I think no one is more surprised to find himself where he is than Donald Trump. You know, he did not expect to kind of... It, it just reminds me of a bank robber who comes in, and he thinks that all the doors are going to be locked, and he just kind of sails right up to the safe. Um, <laughs> And Hillary, again, this is a little, this is why a, a problem for her, her, she should have come for, forward with very futuristic, forward thinking proposals right out of the gate, but her campaign unfortunately reflects her attitude. It's kind of like, it's my turn, damn it. You know, and that's, that's not um, attractive, so. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so let me make a detour through the current president, um, Obama, who you have one column where you talk about Obama's tango, the vertical solitude of being a tango dancer. There's something quite plaintive about our president now, and the, you had a great story in the New York Times you were just talking about. After dinner, he heads off on his own and eats seven almonds, not eight, not six. Uh, lightly what, what, salted. Lightly salted. What, what, what's, what's, what's his psyche like, and how does that prepare for what's going to come afterwards? Um, he, he, more than any politician I've ever met, has a Camus-like sort of existential estrangement. He's, you know, he's a smarty pants and uh, has read everything. And um, we had this great story where he goes after the family dinner and reads and watches ESPN. And um, he will be seen as a transformational president, but the transformation is more who he is, I think, uh, rather than so much what he's done. Because this is one of these great historical ironies that even though we cover these people for two years straight and all these different platforms, sometimes you really don't know who you're electing or what the historical event will come and mix with the gremlins. And this isn't only presidents, there are other alphas 
that this happens to. It happens with New York Times editors a lot where they get the top job and they should be bathed in self-confidence, but for some reason their insecurities come rushing forward and then they begin doing self-destructive things. But that isn't like President Obama, but what, what we didn't know about him, which is strange, is that he really doesn't like politics because he accomplished this incredible feat. You know, with JFK and W, they had these rich daddies who helped them. Obama, you know, did not have a rich daddy. And he had, you know, it's like Game of Thrones. He was the young, handsome African-American prince who had to overcome the queen, uh, usurp the queen, and, and disable the Clinton machine, which just seemed impossible at the outset. And so he accomplished this amazing political feat. And then when he got in office, it became clear that, you know, he likes to stay above the fray. And politics is the fray. So there's this Democratic strategist named Neera Tandon who said, it's as though you found out that Bill Gates didn't like computers. <laughs> or James Carville told me, it's as though you found out that Peyton Manning didn't like football. It's like you have someone incredibly gifted, but really he, and he and Axelrod have also sort of said he just doesn't like what he calls some of the more theatrical elements of the presidency, but in a way they're central parts of the presidency because politics is the art of persuading someone to do something that they don't want to do. And so he doesn't like to do that. And also, like, he doesn't like the part where you comfort people because, as one of his top advisors told me, you know, he'd rather be white, right, he'd rather be right than win. So everything is very cerebral. So he had a bunch of columnists in and he told them that, um, you know, he just doesn't want to come out and comfort jittery Americans when there's a a terrorist attack because you are more likely to slip in the bathtub or uh, get hit by lightning than be in a terrorist attack. And he thinks everybody should pull up their socks, as he has had to do in his life. But, you know, people want their president to be, uh, I can't say paternal, <laughs> but they want their president to be, to articulate their fears and emotions at big moments. And uh, he's a little withholding on that. So if you can stay in this psychoanalytical mode for a moment. Um, Obama beat Hillary in 2008. And then he brought her back in. And now he's effectively opened the door to the White House, or at least a chance at the White House for her by keeping Biden back. And basically, not quite, but almost anointing her. What's that about? Yeah, if I were Joe Biden, I would be really mad. But um, we, had, we had lunch with Biden at the 2012 convention. And at that point, he thought that the Democratic Party had broken this amazing barrier with the first African-American president. And a lot of the women had in the party had had to step back and say, OK, this is going to happen first, but then we're next. And Biden thought the party would demand that. And then when he saw the rise of Bernie Sanders and that young women were supporting Bernie Sanders, Hillary and Biden and everyone was flummoxed. So I was interviewing Bernie Sanders during the primary, and I said, well, Biden thought that he should step back and make way for the first woman. And Bernie Sanders was like, brusque, like, no way, I have better policies for women than Hillary. And the young women voters kind of agreed with him that they did not have to vote for a woman just because they had the same anatomy. So um, that was, to me, that's like a positive evolution in feminism. Um, but the irony of this was when Hillary had her health scare, some Democrats were saying, well, we should have a contingency plan. You know, we should get Biden ready. <laughs> you know, it's an understudy if, if something goes wrong. But uh, Obama, here is the real irony. Obama and Biden's friends in the Senate thought that he 
shot off his mouth too much and he had too many gaffes and you know, that would never play, and Hillary was so steady. And then we entered the era of Trump, and compared to Trump, Biden would look like the consummate diplomat. You know, he would just be this Truman-esque figure walking into the White House. So you never know. I had a boss at the time, who so used to say, Every, you, everything is about who is on the field against you. You know, it's all relative. So speaking of Trump, seeing as you brought him up. Um, your brother, Kevin, is going to vote for Trump. And you wrote a story about that. And my sister. And they have essays in the book about why, yeah. Talk us through that family conversation. Um, yeah, our Thanksgivings are quite interesting. So um, the publishers, it was the publisher's idea, actually, to have Kevin write an essay. And uh, you know, he wrote an essay, and here is why it's interesting, because we can't hear what Paul Ryan is thinking, but if you read Kevin's essay, you know what Paul Ryan is thinking, because they're kind of handcuffed to this uh, crazy candidate who says all this stuff that has nothing to do with Republican orthodoxy, like cozying up to the evil empire. And... Uh, and Kevin can give you an insight into what Republicans are saying behind closed doors. And after the con debacle at the Republican convention, uh, he called me and he said, can you kill my essay about voting for Trump? And I said, no, the book is already shipped. And my sister as well. So, so it's this constant grappling with trying to accept the outrageous things Trump says, but not wanting Hillary Clinton in the White House. Hillary Clinton told a fundraiser out here that she's the only thing standing between us and the abyss. But then, you know, there are people on conservatives who think she's the abyss. So, and there are Trump voters who aren't racist. Um, so. Uh, explain to us how Trump took a chainsaw to every single one of the Republican contenders and he get, went through them methodically and cut them all off the knees. How did that happen? And to what extent was the media perhaps slow to realize what was going on in, in giving him a free pass? Um, yeah, I think when he first got in, he was a novelty, you know, he could be funny. Uh, we hadn't seen, you know, it was it was funny to see the golden apple card of political consultants turned over where he wasn't spending a fortune on ads and, you know, it wasn't business as usual. He was doing it out of his hip pocket and he was telling me once that he was going to make this Instagram ad about... Um, the Chinese, where he would put it on Instagram himself, and he would hire a bunch of Chinese actors, and they'd all be sitting around a table going, Trump, no. <laughs> and uh, he never actually did it. But the idea that he was, you know, running without the money and the consultants and all this other stuff was a novelty at first. And he was kind of making monkeys of people who deserve to be made monkeys of. Like, you know, the, the, some of the, um, the Republicans had used uh, uh, racism and homophobia and misogyny in other elections. They would just, like the Bushes would get Lee Atwater to do it. You know, they would outsource it, and Trump was doing his own wet work. So you could, you know, the Republican Party wanted a more subtle form of racism, you know, so. But is it fair to say that the media was slow to, I'm not saying to criticize him more than other candidates, but to subject him to the same level of scrutiny that other people got? It was all about the Donald for way too long as this, this sort of cartoon character. I think, you know, I think if you Google, uh, there's plenty of information. The Times has done amazing reporting on him. You can see that his, you know, uh, his uh, reputation as a businessman is more from The Apprentice, 
you know, than his own business, that this idea that he, you know, is this businessman who's very firm and makes good decisions and has a heart is the apprentice character. So I think if you want to read about Donald Trump, you can, but his voters are not concerned with that. You know, there was a good quote from a woman, a FedEx driver who was going to vote for Trump in the Times the other day where she said, they, you know, the reporter said, aren't you afraid? Isn't Trump dangerous? And she said, maybe, but I don't care anymore. You know, it's past that. And I realized that Ted Cruz and these guys in Washington and the Tea Party were such nihilists and they wanted to burn down the Capitol they were working in. And, you know, I think they sort of turn the voters into nihilists in a way. They don't care anymore. They just don't want these same dysfunctional people in Washington. So, you know, there was a story in The Guardian about how they're opening rage rooms all over the country and people go in with a baseball bat and, you know, knock out a TV set or something. And uh, so in a way, Donald Trump is the baseball bat in the rage room. Um, they just really want to take a baseball bat to Washington. So where does it go from here? We've got the debate starting next Monday. We've got about six weeks to go. What's it going to look like in the last, uh, last six weeks? Well, the debate, you know, everyone knows is going to be like worldwide wrestling. It's going to be <laughs> the biggest, gaudiest show ever. And um, what's really hilarious is... Um, you can really see the contrast in these candidates because Hillary is the queen of homework and Trump is the king of winging it. And so we have a story in today and, and Hillary is preparing as though it's a court case and she has, you know, two tons of briefing books and she's checking with experts and she's, you know, doing mock debates. And Trump is like at his golf course or <laughs> the Trump Tower having a cheeseburger and uh, thinking up zingers with Roger Ailes. And here's the funny thing. I asked, I called our wonderful Trump reporter, Maggie Haberman, and said, how is Trump preparing for the debate? And she said, he's watching films of himself. <laughs> And so then uh, Katie Turr, who's a great NBC reporter, tweeted today, and she's like, he, they, I think his staff wanted him to watch the film so he could deal with his weaknesses as a debater, but he just loved, you know, he didn't want to do it because he thought everything he had done was perfect. <laughs> so his preparation, you know, really is just looking at himself and thinking he's perfect. <laughs> And her preparation is voluminous, methodical, you know, going through all the facts and figures. I'm going to open up for questions from the floor. Um, who's got some questions there? Thank you very much. Uh, what are your thoughts on the basket of deplorables and how oh, that that's is, my family. How that has rippled through the campaign? <laughs> that's what I call them now. Um, again, I think that uh, the election of, of the first African-American president stirred up a lot of racism. The first woman on a major ticket running is stirring up a lot of sexism. You know, there's this primal death scream from angry white men. But, um, <laughs> but I think also some of the people in the Trump camp are not racist or sexist. They're just really angry. And I defend them because I think they have a right to be angry. I feel like we went into this war in Iraq, which Hillary supported, um, without almost any Americans understanding the tribal intricacies of Sunni and Shia. You know, the economy almost went under, you know, a hair's breadth without most Americans understanding what derivatives were. You know, everybody was supposed to get on board with this bright, shiny object called globalization. 
and nobody was paying attention to the fact that huge swaths of people were really hurting and, and didn't like these trade deals. So I just think that a lot of people have a right to be angry, and um, that's what I think. <laughs> Hello. As a journalist, what do you think of the, the dilemma of Trump's constant lies and a journalist's need to fact check, and every time you fact check, you give him more publicity? How do you deal with that? That's a great question. So this is really interesting. The Times, for the first time, about a presidential candidate or president used the word liar. It was liar in a headline, you know, this week or le I think it was Monday. And uh, Dean Bakay, our editor, was on the radio yesterday kind of explaining it. And, he, you know, it, we just crossed a different threshold with Trump. I mean, he's, his estrangement from truth is so vast <laughs> that it requires a different kind of regard. So, you know, I think that, in, that NBC made a mistake. They were setting up that commander-in-chief forum as a um, entertainment extravaganza showcasing Matt Lauer, but you can't do that in this election. You have to have people who can fact check in their head in real time. So you need a Chuck Todd or an Andrea Mitchell, you know, or a Jake Tapper. I mean, it can't be treated, you know, Trump's treating it as an entertainment extravaganza, but because of his, you know, big fat whoppers, <laughs> you've just got to have people who can fact check it in real time. Actually, you could add to that list Tim Russer. I think this whole campaign would be a whole lot different if Tim Russer were still with us. Two questions, and one, the heart of the um, Trump campaign or who Trump is, seems to be being missed in one level is his emotional stability. And I think you can talk about all the outrageous statements, you can talk about him contradicting himself, whatever, but at least in my mind and a lot of other people's minds, there is something wrong with him, that there is that he is not a stable person, regardless of what he's saying about anything. And that's sort of been hinted you at You put that into your question for me? And, and hinted at there. My question is, why has that not been addressed head on? Oh, I asked him. I said, you're a clinical narcissist. And mo a lot of politicians are narcissists. But I said, if a narcissist at your level gets in the White House, where most presidents have some weird gremlins come out and narcissistic explosions, what would happen? You know, and uh, that's when he just said, oh, I know how to act like a president. When I go to Palm Beach, the society ladies love me, or some non-answer. But, um, you know, Arthur Schlesinger in his memoir said many modern presidents, and <laughs> many, probably many presidents, have been mentally unbalanced. So... It just came out that JFK and Nixon had psychotropic drugs in their medicine cabinets, and Lyndon Johnson's aides used to argue about whether he was a paranoid or a um, manic depressive, and Jimmy Carter saw UFOs. <laughs> and so I was thinking Trump should just say, you know, as a campaign slogan, I've got to jump on this. I'm already crazy. I'm not going to go crazy in office. Um, but I quote Truman in my introduction, who says, you never know how someone is going to accept the responsibility of being president until they're president. And I really think that's true, because uh, W said he would have a humble foreign policy, you know, and then he made the worst foreign policy mistake in, pre in American history. I think. And so, you know, it is really hard, again, to tell how their gremlins interact with a historical event and how they're going to behave. Hi. With the two candidates being so unfavorable, why do you think there hasn't been more press on a third party candidate? Oh, yeah. Um, 
That's a good question. You know, I think that the uh, most unhappy man in the country is Michael Bloomberg. I uh, had lunch with him recently, and he went through the whole thing about why he didn't run, and he told me all the polls and all this stuff, but sometimes you've just got to throw yourself against history. You just, you just can't do it on numbers, you know? And uh, I think Joe Biden and, and Michael Bloomberg are looking at this, and not to mention a bunch of other celebrities like George Clooney and Mark Cuban, who are thinking, wow, if Trump, if it was that easy for Trump, think about, you know, yeah, Amal Clooney was at the Times editorial board yesterday, you know, discussing, I guess she has a lawsuit against ISIS or something. And uh, she sent a big box of cookies, so maybe something's brewing there. Yeah, m my question is, do you think that the statements that he has been making, referring to Mr. Trump, are because he really doesn't want to win, and this is kind of his inner self-saboteur that's taking hold? This is a debate that goes on among our Trump reporters. They debate this all the time. And, you know, I think Maggie might feel he's self-destructive. Um, but I think he wants to win. I just think that you can't tell that because he doesn't want to slink back to Fifth Avenue as a loser. His whole brand will be destroyed. And not only for him, but for poor Ivanka. Um, <laughs> and those big game hunting sons. Uh, yeah, his brand will be trash. So I'm sure he doesn't want to do that. But it's like, Terry, what's the old joke about the Middle East? Is it a tortoise and a scorpion? And they get, you know, they get in the middle and the, the scorpion wants a ride and the tortoise says, oh, you know, I can't because you'll sting me. And the scorpion says, no, I won't because if I do that, I won't get to the other side. And then they get halfway through and the scorpion stings him. And then the tortoise said, why did you do that? And he said, it's in my nature. So Trump is doing all these things because it's in his nature. His ego is his ideology. He's a real estate guy telling any lie in the moment to make the deal. Um, but I think he is not being self-destructive. It's just, it's in his nature. Hi. With the loss of uh, serious schools of journalism fading one after another and the rise of entertainment journalism, how much has that caused or led to 2016 election being what it is? That's a really interesting question. What do you think, Terry? Nice punt. Well, um, I, I, I want to I, I, no, I hear what point. you think and think about it. Um, I, I tell you what I do think. I think the, the narrowing of the number of media outlets is bad for journalism, not just on this campaign, but also for foreign journalism, which is what I did. Because it used to be you would have 10 or 12 pairs of eyes on in any given story. You know, if you were in Afghanistan, there would be a number of people seeing the same thing. Now, it's probably only the New York Times and CNN. And that, that reduces not just competition, but just the amount of information that comes out. Um, and I think that is combined domestically now with a type of infotainment journalism that is not really journalism, which is, you know, is propagated very much by social media. Um, which I think, and, and Maureen, you may disagree with this, and, and the New York Times is a, is a case apart, but a lot of the coverage of Trump was not news coverage. It was, my God, what's he going to say next? That's amazing. You know, and to be fair, if Hillary Clinton makes a comment about deplorables and gets savaged, Trump says things that are way more outrageous. And for the early part of the campaign, it was great. We put him back up on, and he can call into a, <clears throat> a talk show and not even come to the studio, and he'll get on air. So I, I think that that infotainment part of it has, has certainly contributed to some of the, the cheapness of the debate in our current campaign. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know what was really weird? was to watch the fall of Roger Ailes at the Republican convention. Um, you know, for sexual harassment while Trump was defending himself as not being a misogynist. And now Roger Ailes is eating cheeseburgers with 
Trump and plotting zingers. We have time for two more. Um, um, I just, uh, with regard to what you said a few minutes ago, I'm curious as to talking about the self-sabotaging. Uh, my my um, instinct, my perception is that he is so way in over his head. Um, and you know, common knowledge: a person who is that compelled to constantly speak about himself to praise himself, um, to toot his own horn, is fundamentally very insecure. I, I believe that he's, like you said, he didn't expect to be where he is today, and he's a little petulant child who is in over his head and doesn't know what to do. And so for me, this is all a bravado. This is all, you know, um, would you agree with that? Or? That's a brilliant analysis. You know, I used to call political strategists to help me analyze campaigns, and now I call shrinks. And uh, they call this the high chair king syndrome. And, um, <laughs> you know, I had a narcissistic boss. I, I won't say the time frame. And so I did a lot of reading on narcissism and actually interviewed a lot of people to try and understand it. And the best uh, comment I got was from a, a man who told me that Narcissism is like a funhouse mirror. The person who has it can never see themselves as the rest of the world sees them. They either see themselves as much larger or much smaller. And it's weird, because I see the word funhouse mirror creeping into the coverage like about the campaign. They say the campaign is a funhouse mirror. But that's you know how narcissists are so warped, because they can't see themselves as others see them. What do you think about the Russian connection on both sides? Yeah, well, I think that Putin is a perfect uh, example of how absurd this campaign is because Trump has turned his back on, you know, the whole Republican ideology and tradition. And I'm sure Hillary Clinton will probably have some line in the debate, like, you know, Ronald Reagan fought the evil empire and you're having this bromance. But it's so hilarious to watch Republicans twist and turn to try and explain Trump's stance on Putin when the stance is just pure ego. You know, it's just like a little boy saying, he likes me, so I like him. You know, and the party has to kind of turn itself around to try and fit that, which it's crazy. It's just these crazy kind of snap judgments, which are flawed. Like I went to Cuba with uh, Obama and Trump was tweeting that Obama should turn the plane around because Raul Castro didn't come to the tarmac to greet him. And of course, you know, when he went to China and had to go down the back stairs, Trump was saying, you know, turn the plane around. So it would be like government by snit. Um, let me just step in there before the last question. For equal opportunity, you talk about flawed judgments on the snap by Trump. Talk to me about the email controversy around Hillary, because it seems like she has a tendency to make some bad calls as well, and the FBI himself. Said well, I, I told you about that earlier. I just think she has built this wall of secretiveness and defensiveness, and she has these creepy henchmen like Sidney Blumenthal and David Brock around her, and, you know, she just can't seem to dismantle it, and it, it just causes, like with the Whitewater thing, George Stephanopoulos writes in his memoir that if he had could get a genie out of a bottle and make a wish, he would go back and he would persuade her to give the Whitewater Papers to the Washington Post, because he says the story would have been gone in a week. And instead, it led to like nine independent councils and 80 million in taxpayer money. So all of these things snowball because of the initial resistance to transparency. Lamia, you get the last question. Thank you very much. Um, 
I'm not American. I'm uh, the Consul General of Egypt. And whenever I talk to uh, some people of my community uh, and try to uh, know their opinion about the elections, they tell me that, uh, I mean, the majority of them are not interested in the elections because they dislike both candidates. But many of them are going to support Trump. And uh, this is a, it was a surprise to me. I, I really would like to know from you what is wrong about, I mean, what, what went wrong? You would think that these are uh, Christians. No, they're both, both sides, Muslims and Christians. And they're both, you know, I mean, this group is both, uh, I mean, is supportive of Trump. So what do you think? Yeah, I think people just got really angry. The Republicans promised to dismantle Obamacare and, you know, uh, fix immigration and balance the budget, and then they didn't do anything, and Ted Cruz was just being a complete anarchist, and people got angry. Um, and then no one cared that they were angry. So it got in a bad shame spiral. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, have great fun in uh, our election campaign. And Maureen, thank you so much for coming. Thank Fantastic. you, guys.